So when you do something, you don't want to live forever in that place, but you have to realize that things that come before are valuable in the present. Yeah. RenManMusicInBusiness.com. My name is Steve Rennie. I am the Renman, and this little program is called Renman Live. Our guest today is music industry legend Richard Goddard, who's enjoyed one of the most remarkable careers in the music business that you could possibly imagine. And he's going to be with us here today to share his story and advice and some wisdom and insight. So stick around here. Um, if you're new to our program, let me tell you what we're up to. Uh, a couple years ago, I started this website called RenmanMusicAndBusiness.com uh, to help mentor young artists and music professionals about the wicked ways of the music business. It's my goal to inspire a new generation of artists and professionals to make a little bit better music business than we have today, and we want you guys to be a part of it. Um, here's how you learn the music business, folks. Uh, you hang out with smart people. You ask questions, and you make a commitment to learning here. So we want you to be part of it. Uh, we've got a saying around here at Renman MB, if you don't ask, you don't get, and you don't learn anything. So we want you to ask some questions here today, and there's a couple ways you can do that. Um, first off, you can go to our event page, um, which is uh, where we have the, the show right now, and you can post your questions up there right now. You got that code? Uh, here, uh, I have it over here on... Um, Right here, I believe. Bang, there you go. So you go there, folks, right now. You're probably watching that. Post your question. I'll have to give a subject, your question, and it'll post online, and we'll keep track of those during the show, and we'll try to ask them during the show. If you're feeling particularly bold out there, I would suggest you try the Red Man Live hotline, which is 310 310- 469-9067. So you can dial right in, move right to the front of the line, and uh, have all your questions answered. Okay, let's get right down to it. Um, if you watched our last show a couple weeks back, we had two very young entrepreneurs in the EDM world who are doing some amazing, great things in, uh, in the EDM side of the business. Uh, they shared some of their thoughts and insights on the business uh, as two young guys. Together, their ages barely got to 50 years old. I'm a little older than that. Our guest this week has had a 50-year career in the music business as a songwriter, a label founder, a record producer, and uh, a serial music business entrepreneur. Um, as a songwriter, he's hit written number one singles like My Boyfriend's Back and I Want Candy. Um, with a partner, Seymour Stein, he co-founded the legendary Sire Records, which is home to artists like Madonna, Talking Heads, Ramones, Depeche Mode, just to name a few. Uh, as a record producer, he's produced some huge albums for artists like the Go-Go's and Blondie's, Blondie and many more. Um, as I mentioned, he's a serial music biz entrepreneur. In 1997, he founded a company called The Orchard, which is a marketing and distribution company that has helped thousands of independent artists around the world make their music available to everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Mr. Richard Goddard, who I got right in the middle of texting or, or, or tweeting, right? Well, yeah, yeah, I know. I was actually... I'm actually um, um, uh, writing my partner Scott in London, telling him to to watch, uh, to watch the show. I forgot to tell him. It's Let's see if it went out. Technology yeah. over anything. Yeah, and you know what? Pub you know? time there. You could use a little break there at the pub. Let's um, see. All uh, right, Richard. Um, we've had 97 folks yes, on the show so did. far. You did. You got there. Yeah, well, we'll see if he watches it. But, okay, uh, perfect. Uh, maybe he'll call in on our hotline here. Um, oh, if you he heard that, uh, every now and then, tell him to call in. Call in. Show the hotline number again, Cody. 310-469-9067. And I'm now turning off. Okay, now okay. phone's off here. Okay. Um, Richard, we've had a bunch of people on here. This is show number 97. Um, lots of folks are dreaming about getting doing something in the music business. The toughest part is getting started. Uh, I want to ask you, same thing I've asked everybody, how did you get started in the business? What inspired you to, to get in this wacky business? Well, I could, I could go way back, but um, what inspired me to get into the business was um, I, I was a trained piano player. I, I studied classical piano, and um, I just didn't like it that much. And at the point, um, at the point... I began listening in the late, 
early middle late fifties, mm -hmm. there was um, the the coming of the transistor radio, and with the transistor radio, you could begin to take your music mobile, you know. And um, I would listen all the time to this disc jockey, Alan Freed. Alan Freed was essentially the father of rock and roll. He coined the phrase, and um, um, I started listening to the songs and learned about learned about the blues. Uh, remember, we um, we lived uh, at that time. We lived in a completely segregated society. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, white kid, white middle class kids like me, really had very little exposure to. Um, to uh, rhythm and blues and, and black music. Mm. Well, Alan played it, you know, and um, because of that, I would listen to the songs and I would think, gee, I could write that, you know? And I started fiddling with uh, blues songs on the piano. And one of my earliest songs is really funny, um, was a song called I'm on Fire. Mm. And um, at that time, there was a competition between Jerry Lee Lewis and Elvis Presley for who would be the big, uh, Teenage Sensation. Of course, Presley uh, won, but, um, but for me, because I was a piano player, it was Jerry Lee. Mm -hmm. And um, I wrote this song called I'm on Fire, and um, it was like Great Balls of Fire. Mm -hmm. And eventually, eventually, I got to meet him and play him for him. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he recorded it, and it was uh, a moderate hit, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's known to people who are fans of, of mm -hmm. Jerry Lee Lewis. Those of you that have never heard Jerry Lee Lewis, which is probably most of the most audience. Of the um, he was and still is amazing, a uh, brilliant um, um, rock and roll, uh, <laughs> blues, gospel piano player with an amazing voice. He eventually went country, and uh, uh, I'm on Fire was his last rock and roll uh, hit. Yeah, I know you were six, 15, 16 uh, years 16. old at the time, so yeah. you haven't even finished high school and you're, and you're thinking about writing hits. Well, I'm thinking of writing songs. Yeah. Hits were, hits yeah. are not that easy to come by. Yeah. So, but then when you're 16, uh, you think you can do anything. Yeah. I want to talk about that. That's a, a good segue. Um, I find that lots of folks are enthusiastic or have a desire to do something great in the music, or do something great in their life, um, period. Um, their experience level doesn't typically match their enthusiasm. And you just said something, that as you get a little bit older, you realize how little you knew when you were young. Um, I started this website to help mentor young artists along the way. And it's been interesting because we've, I found that there's been this cross-generational exchange of information. There's things that I've learned that are still appropriate today. There are things that I'm learning today from young folks like these kids we had last week. Um, you've had a long career in the business. You had a lot of success early in your career, and you continue to have success. Um, I'm wondering, how did you learn the music business? Did you have mentors along the way that helped shape your mentality? Um, it was a lot different then. Um, I actually, uh, the first mentor <laughs> was a man named Henry Tobias. And I used to sit in the living room of the apartment in the Bronx and I'd just play my songs. And uh, it was on the second floor, but it was on a hill. So literally, if you were walking down the hill, you could look right in. And the window would be open because it was summertime. And this guy looks in and says, hey, kid, that's great. <laughs> so I Your said, first A&R input. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> so uh, so he, he said, you know, you want to come downtown to my office and play the songs, and I'll, uh, I think I can do something with them. So I said, you got to talk to my father. You know, I was at that point 15 or so. And, um, and uh, we checked, checked the guy up. He was um, a popular songwriter. Mm -hmm. Uh, at that time, he was an older guy, probably in his 40s. <laughs> mm. So, so um, uh, he was the one that got me down into the Brill Building, 1650 Broadway. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about it, the Brill Building. Yeah. And, um, and from there, um, I learned how to make demos. Mm. And to make a demo, it, uh, it's not the way it is today. You actually had to go to a recording studio, so like of which <laughs> there were not that many. Mm -hmm. So to get access to the recording studio was a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you have your moment, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, because we're also talking about manoral, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. maybe two track recording. Mono for you kids out there that have no idea what that is. Yeah, I mean, you're, mm -hmm. you're playing around on, uh, you know, uh, garage band or... Um, Back or then there's what, four Pro tracks? No, there's track. one track. One track. Yeah, so everybody track. plays live, bang, done. You, you have to rehearse. Uh, you set, you, you have to have a great song, the singer sings while the band plays. <laughs> uh, right. And then there was a process that mm -hmm. as, as we learned more, uh, where you could mix down from two, mm -hmm. what well, was three tracks. So essentially you had two channels and then you, would, you could separate the voice and then eventually four track mm -hmm. uh, cell syncing where you record the entire band mm -hmm. and then you mix that down to two channels and it'll leave you two channels and you could bounce back and forth on those two. And you have to remember that's where uh, the Beatles how the Beatles records were made and all the massive uh, Phil Spector uh, recordings, Amazing. all on four track. Amazing to think today. Let's talk about your, your early days as a songwriter. You mentioned the Brill Building. Do we have a graphic there, Cud? Yeah, we do. Um, in New York City. It's, for, again, for some of the young huh. folks that are watching today, um, you know, I'll just say to you folks, Google this stuff because it's, it'll give you some great backdrop. Um, the Brill Building was famous in New York City, famous in the music business because it housed some of the greatest songwriters, publishers, and labels. Talk about those early days um, at, at the Brill Building and what it was like to work in, 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 a, in such a wonderfully creative environment that I'm not sure there's any equivalent today. Well, it probably is that creative environment in Nashville, I would guess. Um, but uh, certainly in New York, it's not that way any longer. You, you had these, when you say the Brill Building, it's um, an area that comes from the uh, David Letterman Theater. It used to be the old Ed Sullivan Theater, uh, down through 1650 Broadway to the actual Brill Building, which is on 49th Street in Broadway. So if you can just imagine this area. And um, as a kid who wrote uh, songs, because so we weren't producing records then, uh, what you could do is walk through the buildings with your songs, knock on doors, and um, ask, uh, ask them to listen. And, uh, and the idea was to find a publisher who would take an option on the song, give you a very small advance, mm. anywhere from 10 to $25. But again, in those days, you say $25 could be several hundred today yeah. or more. But, um, um, and they would then try to get a cover recording of the song. Um, eventually, after some time doing that, I became friends with two other guys, Bob Feldman and Jerry Goldstein, and we became a writing team. Mm -hmm. And we would write all the songs together, and we eventually uh, got a relationship with a publisher who gave us a little room with a piano, uh, and in that little room, they would come in and say, so-and-so is looking for a recording, yeah. uh, needs new material for the next single. No albums, there yeah. were no albums then. And uh, you would actually work and write that song. So you would learn not only how to write a song, but how to um, adapt something for a particular type of performance. It's interesting how much has changed because I get so many emails and questions about how do I get a song in front of a publisher? How do I make all these things happen? And interesting to see how it's changed so much. Back then, you could walk through the hallways up and down the elevator and make some connections. That's not true today. Um, interesting, well, too, that, you know, in, when you started, singles was the business and then albums. And ironically, for the folks that are watching, um, okay, we'll take that phone call in one second. Ironically, today, um, we're kind of moving back to it's all about a single or an EP, well, not the album. Thoughts? Well, yeah, yeah. Well, the album, I mean, there was a point where the album was really important. And that would probably be from the Beatles uh, onward, mm. you know, Pink Floyd, uh, uh, The Who. So you, you, you basically had uh, a time when an album expressed this, this total vision mm -hmm. that an artist had. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was significant. After a while, it became big business. You know, uh, let's feed the public uh, one or two things they might like and suck them into buying, buying the a thing. more expensive package. Uh, that probably comes from uh, more of a corporate mentality. Yeah. You know, and there's a, I'd like to say there's something wrong with it, but the truth is uh, business is part of the reality. And um, if, if 
record companies or entertainment companies are not able to sustain themselves. They can't fund the creative, yeah. uh, po uh, creative part. Yeah, that's why they call it the music business. All right, we've got a question on the phone. What I love about our little web show is we get people coming around from just about everywhere, and they get a great chance to connect with people they might not meet otherwise. Who do we have on the phone, Mr. Romnus? This is Matt from Minnesota. Hey there, Steve. It's Matt from Minnesota. Matt from Minnesota. You're on with Richard Goddard. Thanks for calling. Hey, thank you. Uh, Richard, I had a question for you. You touched sure. on it briefly a second ago. Um, when it comes to connections, because I've been part of the Minneapolis scene here for a little right. bit, and I just have felt that the people I've been getting in contact with and the people I've been working with are, you know, they're all right, but they're not like the cream of the crop. So what are some tips and tricks that you would suggest for getting in touch with like the right people and the most impactful people in your local scene? Yeah, and the local scene, uh, many, the thing about Minneapolis is it was always a great music scene. Uh, I know it's, um, it's small, relatively small compared to, uh, um, uh, compared to uh, Los Angeles and New York, but, but it's, always been a, um, it's always been a music center. I mean, uh, not quite Minneapolis, but Hibbings. I mean, Bob Dylan came from there, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Prince came from Minneapolis. Uh, so mm -hmm. there is a way in and out of that, and also a number of Muscadu um, um, the replacements. The replacements certainly Suburbs. came from there. I, you know what it gets down to is there's probably um, um, a great history um, of uh, music there, and there are great people that play, um, you know, that play their instruments well and are interested in uh, in busting out and succeeding. I mean, finding those people on a local scene is a little, um, it's challenging, but it's the luck of the draw, I guess. But there's one thing in Minneapolis, I make a recommendation, I don't know to how you could work with them, but we have a label we distribute at the Orchard called Rock the Cause. Um, I, I don't okay. know if you're familiar with it, but, but what it is, is, is a charitable label. Uh, their big success is a fascinating story, now I forgot his name, but uh, the song is called Clouds. And he's, he, um, he was a, a Minneapolis musician that was very young, and he, um, he, he got a cancer. And mm -hmm. as he was passing, he actually made this recording. And uh, we've sold um, uh, millions of downloads of the song. Um, I thought they were really, really good people doing something really, really special, uh, Rock the Cause. And uh, if you okay. want, send your email um, uh, send, to Rem, send, yeah, send and, a note I'll, to me. Um, and I'll send you the contact information from them. And they work with bands, and um, you can work as a part of the charitable organization and at the same time get exposure. Matt, let me ask you a question. That sounds awesome. Matt, yeah, are, you a, yes. are you a gigging band? Um, I, so I have one current project right now that's currently on hiatus, uh, and that is part of what this stems from. Richard, great answer, by the way. Um, Thank you. The other two guys in my band are both uh, university students, so their priorities are a little tied up right now, and that's really frustrating for me. So like I said, they're great musicians, just I don't think they have their head exactly pointing in the direction that I do, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's, you know, it's tough finding the right partners. We're going to talk a little bit about some of Richard's partners. He had some great songwriting partners. It's tough finding the right partners because it, they got to have the right headspace, right work ethic, same goals, and all of that stuff. Uh, well, Matt, I, anything else? I wish you the best of luck on all your stuff. I hope that answered your question there. It and, does. Really know, appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. And Thanks, I wanna, Rich. And I want to thank you for calling in. If you uh, will hang on, and James will get your email address. We'll send you a uh, T-shirt for being so bold as to move to the front of the class. Or you can get one of these fine coffee mugs or mouse pads. We, we have all kinds I, of swag I here. I get Rich. that also, you right? Get, you yeah, get, well, absolutely. Okay. We, don't, we don't pay very much here, so no, we have, to, no, that's we have true. to give out the swag. <laughs> no, you know? no. Uh, so there you go. Anyway, thanks that's for calling. Badass. Thanks, Steve. All right, thank you. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about this songwriting thing, right? Um, you know, lots of folks dream about writing big hit songs, yeah. uh, whether that, that was their motive in the beginning or not. Um, big hit songs that stand the test of time. Um, you actually did that uh, more than a few times. Uh, I want to ask you, as a songwriter, what do you think are the elements of a hit song in your opinion? And has that changed over your 
years in the business? Yeah, I don't know. That it seems. I used to ride down on the subway from the Bronx and make a list of titles, close my eyes and see if I could see them on what was then the, uh, the definitive trot, the cash box trot. And, um, and if I could see the titles there, I'd go into my partners and I'd say, well, uh, let's write a song called this. You know, so you start with the title. Um, so I would. Um, I think I'll give you an example. One of our huge hits when we were kids, I was 23 years old, was a song called My Boyfriend's Back. So it's really a true story. Bob Feldman, one of my writing partners, came in, was at a, um, was at a coffee shop in Brooklyn, and some girl came running into the shop and started screaming at this guy at a table at, at a, not a coffee, um, not a coffee shop, a candy store, mm. and started um, started screaming, "My boyfriend's back! He's gonna kill you! <laughs> you've been you've been saying these things about me!" So all of a sudden, we go in and we start writing the story, and we put it together with a hey la hey la, and get the right kind of beat with it, and that structured it. That was a song that's now lived since 1963 still gets recorded, and Back East is part of a huge um, winter commercial campaign run by uh, Hess Oil and Gasoline Stations. Uh, and every year, instead of my boyfriend's back, it's the Hess trucks back, and, mm -hmm. Hess, and they make Hess trucks. I little it, trucks. It, it, it only you know highlights the power of a great song that oh, they yeah. last forever. That those moments that you capture in just that little moment of time wind up lasting forever. You've had some wonderful covers over the years, and some songs that I didn't even know you had written. You know, um, I remember "Bow Wow Wow." Did I want candy? Jay Bobery, our friend Jay, Bo I think they're on IRS Records, weren't they? Bow Wow. No, wow. no, they weren't on IRS Records. They were on, if you can believe it, RCA. That's right. It was they produced by. Kenny Laguna, who uh, also Jett. for years produced uh, Joan Jett manager and too, right? manages Joan Jett. Yeah. Got it. Uh, another one I did not know. For all you folks out there, feel free to Google it. <clears throat> Sorrow yeah, by David yeah, Bowie. I thought that was his song. I didn't realize yeah. that was a Sorrow cover. was recorded on the first uh, album by the McCoys, the band that I had the song Hang On Sloopy that we produced. And uh, we wrote and produced it for them. It was quite different. It was meant to be like, um, like a finger-picking bird's 12-string song. And in those days, the Mercy Beat British bands were not writing their own songs. They were still coming uh, and looking in America for songs to cover. Uh, the song was covered by a band called the Merseys. And David learned it... Uh, uh, from when he was a kid listening to the radio and um, how it got recorded by David Bowie was that he was doing an album called Pinups, uh, which were all his favorite songs, uh, cover songs that he learned. Mm -hmm. And and then he Bowieized it, and it was great. And his version is fantastic. It is it is fantastic, boy. You also that one, Hang On, Sloopy. I didn't realize you wrote that one too. Well, Who was we the did. We did produced that was the record. The, who was it that did the song? The McCoys. The McCoys. God, I can yeah. remember hearing that one on the radio. Okay, I, we, we won't keep reminiscing here too much. Um, all right, there was one more funny story that I I want you to talk about. You know, you'd written that song, I Want Candy, right? Yeah. And. You guys didn't set out to be performers. You were more songwriters, but you kind of stumbled into a brief, mo brief moment there as a uh, as a performer. Talk about your days or day or two as the Strange Loves. Oh, it, yeah. So, um, so now you have to imagine that uh, the whole Brill Building scene is sort of um, falling apart because um, the Brits are coming over. And they're writing their own songs, the Beatles, the Stones, the Kings, the Who, you know, and they're writing their own songs. And that's what's on American radio is um, basically British bands or British artists. So um, we had a song uh, that was a ska song, not I Want Candy Yet. Uh, we had a song that was a ska beat song. It was an old standard. And in the middle of it, um, one of our partners did a fake British accent, you know, uh, narration, uh, a little love that slowly goes and goes, mate, I love that goes, blah, 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 blah. And, um, and, and because of that, 
uh, we got an offer to come down to Virginia Beach, Virginia, where the disc jockey said, I can make this record number one in Virginia Beach, of course. Um, uh, but you can't be um, American. You have to be uh, from Britain. But we couldn't be English, we figured, because we get, uh, we get found out. So uh, we had to uh, become part of uh, the British um, Commonwealth somehow. So we picked Australia. <laughs> and uh, we became Australian. We went down uh, to Virginia Beach. That was our first show as Australians. We went down to Virginia Beach. Of course, we drove down with, with uh, an entourage of crazy people and um, um, pulled into the radio station, at which point the disc jockey, Gene Loving, said, no, 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 you guys got to get out of here. You're supposed to be flying in from Australia. So we drove out to the airport, pulled into the terminal in a one-engine plane, uh, <laughs> And people actually had teddy bears, jelly beans, uh, you know, Virginia Beach, Walton, the Strange Strangelove. Mm -hmm. We then went out and started touring as the Strangelove's, you know, and um, um, we would wear, if you have a picture, we'd wear zebra you have a skin. Picture of that strange, I don't we'd think wear we have zebra the strange loves here. Zebra skin vests and uh, drums. Of course, there were no zebras and we in Australia and yeah, drums but, that were from Africa and drums that were from Africa. We we told people they were Aboriginal. Uh, the, the, the point being that uh, Australia at that time could have been the moon to Americans. And it probably still is to most Americans. I always found it interesting that the English folks, you know, sent all the criminals to America and Australia where they had sun and surf and beer and they kept England. Just saying out there, I don't want to offend any of our English friends. Uh, okay, let's change gears for a second here. Um, um, Actually, we have a question from our chat room, or actually on our uh, event page I want to ask here. Um, uh -huh. And it is as follows. There's a gentleman by the name of Irish, my then, I think he goes, uh, that's his name, I, I'll just read the question. He said, Richard, after you've basically seen and done it all with the most iconic of artists in this business, how do we, the new wave, get your attention? Is there really anything new coming out? What's your advice for someone who wants to stick to their musical truth, but also wants to push to the next level? Great question. Yeah, well, first of all, remember, it's, it's, about, it's about the song. Uh, you still have to have a great song, but there are so many ways today to uh, reach people. I, I, you know, through playlists on places like Spotify, um, um, uh, SoundClouds, um, um, certainly YouTube uh, and uh, Facebook. Uh, you actually can reach out, Instagram, uh, all the rest of them. You can reach out to people and uh, don't think that the um, people who are really making decisions definitely are looking at that. You know, I mean, that's, um, that's the present, but it's also, it, it's also the future. And um, you can not have direct contact with people, but you can put yourself in a position where there's a chance of discovery. When I started, you had to actually do it face to face. So if something good comes up, you find people will get in touch. And certainly at The Orchard, um, you're free to write me at richardattheorchard.com. And uh, I'll listen to your music and um, give you some comments back. I think that's great advice because so I think because of the internet today, Richard, so people feel like you know people should just be watching. But some things haven't really changed at all. You know, it took a lot to get somebody's attention back in the old days when it was face to face. The fact that millions of people can put their stuff out there makes it more difficult to find those folks. Um, but it's still about making those connections and making the effort and just committing to putting yourself out there where you think people in the music business are hanging out. We've had all kinds of folks on the show over the last couple of years that will. All testify to the fact that they are watching and looking for signs uh, of life, signs of something happening on the web. So for all you folks out there watching, um, if, you, if, you, if you look out there and you put your stuff out there and nobody hears about it right away, don't go to pieces. Just keep doing it. You had another comment? Yeah, I was just going to say that you're right, that um, there's a glut <laughs> all mm. across it and uh, it's hard to stand out and you may not stand out. But the one thing I learned from, uh, from the first day, if you, don't, if you don't get in the game, you have no chance of winning. So get in the game somehow, even if, even if, it's, uh, even it's, if it's in the smallest way. But, you know, you got to play if you want to win.
and uh, yeah, that's about no it. No truer words have ever been so said, folks. You got to play to win. You don't ask. You don't get. You know, it's a, it's the same story, folks. If you're going to be, uh, if a couple knows bum people out, I tell them you got no chance in the music. Better attitude is I'm going to hear a thousand no's before I get to those one or two great yeses, and. Every no gets you closer to the yes. And if that's not your mentality, you won't oh, last. And the other side, I'll tell you, is we're all idiots. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, everybody makes mistakes. Yeah. For all the uh, for all the number of people that probably turned down Madonna, uh, my partner Seymour Stein saw that magic. Perfect. You know, and that's the point. Mm -hmm. um, and and when you look at her as an example, or anybody as successful, she kept going yeah. because she believed in herself. So you have to believe in yourself and um, and hope for the best. Yeah, let's. Uh, that's a great segue. Uh, Seymour Stein. For some of you folks again that aren't familiar with Seymour Stein and Sire Records, uh, you should you know Google that. Um, <laughs> Sire Records, I'll fill you in, was was one of the premier kind of tastemaker, ahead of the game labels. And when I was a kid, or actually just not a kid, mm -hmm. I was just starting to get in the music business when Sire was getting its chops. Um, you signed bands like Madonna, Talking Heads, The Ramones, Depeche Mode, um, Seal, huh? Pretenders. Pretenders were on Sire, one of my favorite bands of all time. Talk about how you transitioned from being songwriter, right, to oh. now going on to the business side of things. For some folks, that's not an easy transition. For you, you seem to handle that one pretty effortlessly. Talk about your days with Sire, how you got started in... in, well, in my days with Sire were the early days with Sire. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the things that you mentioned um, uh, came after I left Sire, mm -hmm. but uh, Seymour and I built the uh, basis mm -hmm. of, uh, of how the label could develop into something. Um, but um, when it comes to signing those acts, Seymour signed them. Um, it, going into business uh, rather than being a songwriter is, I don't know, I thought it was kind of, uh, it, it was a simple transition, but you have to remember it came after uh, the Brill Building writing stuff um, started to go down and um, I would say the world started changing. We started becoming, uh, we started becoming more of a, I'll use the word hippie, mm -hmm. environment. And uh, I was thinking of writing songs that were significant, you know, never dreaming that I want candy on my boyfriend's back could mean something to somebody <laughs> years later. So in my effort to do that, I found myself not writing songs. Mm -hmm. So that sort of led me to uh, this partnership with Seymour, where I was still doing creative stuff and producing the, producing the uh, records, and Seymour had the um, um, ability to promote. He mm. was a great promotion man. He started as a radio promotion guy, he wasn't he? He started as a promotion man. He, um, he worked, um, he actually was responsible for um, uh, the charts at Billboard at one time. Um, and... Um, so he had lots of connections, and he was mentored by a man named Sid Nathan, who, um, who was the founder of King Records, the label of James Brown and, yeah. and many others. Um, and Seymour used that knowledge together with uh, what, what I knew, and together we, we built this uh, label that initially was built on, uh, again, an entrepreneur um, mentality. We would go to Europe, and um, acquire albums. Now we were getting close, and here's where it becomes important again, and, and uh, get, it becomes something like today. Right at that point in time, in America, we were shifting from the AM signal to FM. FM was stereo, so it's a bit more modern, and with stereo, you could play these wonderful albums. And uh, we would go over and visit the companies in London that had affiliates in the United States, uh, and the affiliates were not releasing the albums that were made because they weren't hits. Mm -hmm. Well, we came in there and said we'd release them, and the export departments were very happy with that. And um, they just wanted to get license. the music out there. Well, yeah, well, they're getting paid to yeah. do that. And um, uh, another amusing story, if it matters to anybody, um, uh, what we would do was 
we would go over to London with about uh, a dozen uh, New York City uh, cheesecakes. And we would go to these export divisions, and it's amazing uh, how you can addict people to uh, cheesecakes. And, um, and we'd come in after the third time, they'd ask you if you got a cheesecake, and I'd say, well, you know, you have an album for us? And um, we built relationships. Cheesecakes helped us build relationships. So I don't know what one would use today as a cheesecake, but I'm sure uh, well, we're a lot more we're a lot more advanced. Maybe we use um, uh, pseudo sex. I don't yeah. Know. Well, I was going to say that the the music business has uh, served up quite a few addictions over the years. Uh, I think See, well, an addiction know, I mean, to cheesecakes would probably be one, metal of, band. <laughs> <laughs> be one of the the healthier ones. You'd only get fat. You wouldn't have a heart attack. But I'm not confessing to anything, folks. Um, but that's great advice, folks. You know, sales by cheesecakes. Write that down. We're going to be testing you later. Let's take. Uh, talk Talk about your work as a producer. You start as a songwriter. You 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 transition from that. Maybe it wasn't as much an act of vision as it was survival. You want to stay in the business. You start this great label, and you've continued to create stuff. You produced as a producer some unbelievably great records. Records again that I was listening to as I was starting in the business. Um, the Go Go's comes to mind. Local band here in L.A. who um, I used to watch in little clubs when they were nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, we had our friend Jay Bober who was one of my might have been a second guest on the show. We talked IRS. about. Yeah. He brought, you know, he talked about how important your work was there. Blondie, my wife worked for years at Chrysalis Records. There they are, the young Blondie. Uh, Clem Burke played in a band I managed, drum, uh, Dramarama, after Blondie, uh, in, as he's still <coughs> doing Blondie. Um, talk about your role of, as a producer in this whole hit making process. Um, what were the things you learned as a songwriter and performer that helped you in your role as a producer? Well, you learn the same thing. It's, it's about the song. Um, it's also about the ability of the artist to have some sort of personality and ability to deliver the message live and communicate with people. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a communication process. You know, it's not the luck of the draw. And um, I guess in the past you could promote differently, but it's still the same thing. Do you want to get to know that person? So... Uh, producing, I'll just use Blondie and the Go-Go's, for example. Um, I met um, Blondie uh, at Debbie at um, CBGB's. After leaving Sire, I started hanging around CBGB's and uh, knew there was a buzz going on. And um, uh, out of the CBGB scene, I recorded um, uh, Blondie, uh, Richard Hell and the Voidoids, uh, Blank Generation, and a guy with a great voice, a rockabilly guy, Robert Gordon. Um, all, all three very special. Um, and songs were the basis of mm -hmm. all of them. Mm -hmm. Even with the deep punk of uh, Richard Hell, his songs were great. Blank mm -hmm. Generation's a great song. Mm -hmm. um, when I met Debbie, uh, they asked if um, I was going to put together an album of, um, of uh, greatest hits of CBGB, putting bands together. And she asked if it could be on the album. And I... I said, well, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, I have to hear you play. And I remember walking into that studio, the rehearsal studio I got, and grinning from ear to ear, beginning to end, one song after another. It was just wonderful. And the band had a joyous way of playing. And I would say the same thing uh, about the Go-Go's. Um, at that time, I was really finished. I didn't really want any more um, all-female artists. And uh, I... Um, Miles Copeland, um, who Jay worked with um, at IRS, who was the head of owned IRS, um, kept telling you, got to go see these girls. You got to see. Finally, I went to NYU and I saw them. They were playing at um, at one of the concert centers at NYU. Um, and again, same reaction. Made no difference. Belinda was a great performer, but the songs, bang, you know. And and listen, if you want to succeed in the business. Uh, uh, that's what it takes. You either have to write the song, find it, or have producers that, if you're an artist, that can help you put, put the elements together so you mm. can sing a great song. Yeah, that's, I've, I say it to folks all the time. You know, they, I find that people want to overthink the music business. There's a million things you could think about mm -hmm. to drive yourself crazy in the music business. Uh, we can talk about the internet. We can talk about what all these things are doing to the business. But at the end of the day, if you don't have great songs, 
in great performances of those songs, whether it's on record or in, in person, mm -hmm. you don't have a, a music biz. You can only, you know, there's so many new tools out there, auto-tuning. I've heard some mixes, God bless her, Britney Spears, you know, the off-the-board mix, and you just go, oh my God, right? Oh. So they can fix the tuning, but you can't necessarily fix it if there's no song there, and she's a great performer, right? So she has a career. So great songs and great performances, folks. That's what it's all about. Um, I told you we, are, we, we, we wanted to provide an opportunity for people to uh, ask questions here. Um, and it's been nice to have some folks calling in. And if you still want to call in on our hotline, 310-469-9067, you feel free to do that. We've got a section on our website, Cody, if you'll show it here on the computer. It's called Ask Ren Man where um, I encourage people to post their questions online. Uh, there's a whole, Jesus, we got a whole bunch. Of, I better get busy here. Holy crap. Uh, <laughs> this question I'm going to read to you right now is not enough. Go back up to the top there, back to the FBJ. Here's how easy it is, folks. You go in here to our website. You got to be a member. If you're not a member, you'll go up to the top of the page up here and register. I'm already registered, obviously. And you go, click on this Ask Renman uh, link. It'll bring you to this page right here. You put your topic of your question how do I become famous? Uh, your actual question, I want to be a big star. How do I make that happen? You click submit, and I will personally answer all these questions. Uh, as we mentioned at the top, you can also do it by posting <clears throat> your question online. And I'm going to take one right now from Pushing Up Daisy. It's more of a manager's question, but I'll ask you to weigh in as well, Richard. <clears throat> it says, can you reach out to managers the way you would reach out to record labels? Is there a great way to pique their interest? It seems that some artists who aren't established but talented build relationships with management who help get the ball rolling with their careers. Any thoughts? Well, you're right about part two. Once you get a great manager, they can help you maneuver your way through the music business. The best way, and I'm, I'm going to say it right up front, most people don't want to hear it, the best way to get a manager's attention today is by going out and getting something started on your own. Uh, the deep, dark secret uh, for, I think, for, for a managers and, and agents and, and maybe true with labels and, and, and publishers to a degree, they're really not that excited about getting in on square one. They want to see something going on. Do you agree, yeah. Richard? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's um, what we have to remember. Um, we, we could sit here and talk about the music business, but it's really the music business. And, uh, and the truth is that um, unless you find a very young, uh, hungry manager, for the most part, um, I believe managers look to get involved with people who have something uh, already going. Um, and uh, it would be the same for record labels. You know, I, it, it used to be the record labels would take an artist and maybe develop them over two or three albums. Hmm. That's just not a reality today. Um, most labels will maybe start somebody very, very young uh, and um, give them a quote demo deal or just work with them. But I think labels themselves want to see action, whether it's through YouTube or Facebook. And um, they want to see you building something and then they have the wherewithal to really bring it home. And I'll tell you and something. I'll tell you something else for our friend here. You know, today, as opposed to when we started business, we have so many more tools available at your disposal to help paint a picture of what your creative vision is. You can do a video for virtually no money with cameras like my son is clicking here, 5D Canon camera. They can do cinematic quality. If you don't own one, you can rent one. If you live in a big city, there's some kid at a university that's dreaming about mm -hmm. being a, a, a director. Um, you have the ability to post your music online, whether it's SoundCloud, whether it's your Facebook page, whether it's Reverb Nation or otherwise. So for you artists out there that are looking to get somebody's attention, I will tell you something that I, I've counseled lots of people. Put something up there that represents the best of who you are so that if Richard Goddard or somebody comes along, that they have a good idea of what you're all about. It'll help them make a decision whether they think there's some potential. Fair comment? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have to... The, the tools are available today. It doesn't mean you'll succeed with them, but, but they're available. And if, if you're not willing to make the effort then there's very little chance you're going to succeed. While we're on the subject of Ask Renman out there and tools that are at our disposal today, we have a brand new Renman MB app, right? I didn't think I would even be thinking about all this stuff here. Do you have a, do we have a look at the app? Um, you can find it on Google uh, Play, and you can also find it um, 
uh, at the iTunes store. There it is. Uh, we have we got all kinds of getting started stories. You know, uh, ask Ren Man. We got a whole bunch of those in there that winds up being my own kind of. 2014 version is an FAQ on the music business, Richard. Just my opinion, but check it out, folks. That way you can, the learning never stops. You can be on a train home tonight and be networking. By the time they get home, they're likely to be able to watch you and I uh, doing this show again today. I'm laughing because your uh, logo looks like an alien branding uh, cattle iron. Brand, you know, if you had a ranch, throw? it looks <laughs> like a ranch, you know? I mean, look at it, and then the two feet going down. Well, then no. You could see that that's either like a railroad train coming at you, a choo-choo train, you, you wanna... or or that's uh, some uh, a aliens Cody? just landed. Right? Can you imagine? Shh. Shh. There's oh, our man. there's our there's our I'm, next swag. Shh. You know, you want to hear some I mean, story? Honestly, the, the, the history of that was we had a young guy help me put all this together. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's a no, good it's logo. A, I'm not changing. I like it. I, I'm not going to just wave it. Change it. It was one side is the R. If the bottom part is an M, and if you look at the top, it's kind of a B. But he said. It reminded him of the I, the Tiger Woods logo, ETW. And I, I thought, you know what? Really? I'm I'm, well, I'll show you that I, one I later. Don't, I don't know. Enough on that logo. <laughs> Next time you get on the show, we're going to stick You're that on the brain. way up. Tiger's on the way down. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Easy. I, I'll tell you what. No, I know. If it all ended for Tiger tomorrow, it's been a pretty nice ride. I know, I know. Uh, at any rate, enough on our mobile app and, and uh, that stuff. So I want to uh, talk about... The Orchard, you know, I, I refer to you as a serial entrepreneur because you're an interesting character, Richard, in the sense that you effortlessly flow between the creative and the business side of it, or you certainly don't shy away from the business side of it. Uh, in 1997, you started a company called The Orchard, um, Orchard, I should say. I want to ask you, what motivated you to start The Orchard? How's it involved? How's it evolved over the years? Um, so tell the folks a little about The Orchard right there. Sure. The Orchard is, um, well, first of all, uh, you're talking about what I do and how I get from place to place. I, I think uh, my motto to myself is move forward. Mm. In times of adversity, move forward. <laughs> Makes no difference. Don't retreat. Um, and uh, if one thing doesn't work, do something else. Um, the Orchard uh, started by accident. Uh, we had a Scott Cohen I, and I, Scott is my partner and co-founder of The Orchard. He lives in London now and uh, is a VP out of our uh, London office. Um, uh, we had a small record label and uh, we had limited distribution. And uh, what we would do was we, we would use the nascent internet even before broadband to get our interns to um, uh, poach on uh, any site they could and say, did you hear the new consolidated record? Have you heard this? Have you heard that? And during the course of that, we discovered that there were places uh, that were actually selling records. Uh, it was uh, mail order CDs at the time. Uh, it, one place was CD Now, that's no longer with us, and Music Boulevard. I These are both. great, great places. Mm -hmm. uh, great uh, imagination to get these things in place, and uh, contacted them and uh, wanted them to take our records into their stores, at which point we found out that um, they couldn't because they literally weren't record stores, they were virtual fronts. So remember you started, um, I remember you started the um, conversation in the show with ask questions, ask mm -hmm. questions, ask mm -hmm. questions, and I remember saying, well, why not? You know, any kid can say that, but you mm -hmm. say, why not? And they said, well, because we're not a shop, we're a virtual. Next question, well, how do you do it? And they told me. And there was a place in California called Valley Media. Valley was a big, you might remember yeah, them, a big one-stop distributor. Mm -hmm. They were the back end for all <clears throat> the internet stores, mm -hmm. okay? Got on a plane with Scott, flew out to Valley in um, uh, Sacramento, sat down with them, and, uh, and here's another lesson. Uh, sat down with them and, and told them we would bring them all the independent music in the world. At the time, we had none. Um, and, uh, but we had the idea. And all they wanted to talk to me about was Blondie, the Go-Go's, I mean, everything else, you know? And, uh, and the lesson you learn from that is that your past is valuable when it pays dividends, because it pays dividends yes. in the present. 
So when you do something, you don't want to live forever in that place, but you have to realize that things that come before are valuable in the present. Yeah. And, uh, and because of that, they said, we trust you. <laughs> Why, I don't know. <laughs> but you but didn't question. <laughs> we became, we became the, the providers to these stores that Valley supplied um, of all the independent content. Yeah. And at that time, when we were uh, drawing up our agreement with the artists that came to us, uh, we um, also asked them to give us their digital um, the right to sell their music digitally, mm. which of course everyone did because there was no place to sell the music digitally. And um, we, I guess we anticipated the coming of iTunes by six years. I was going to say, that idea, which seems so simple and like a no-brainer and nobody could imagine a different day, what's been wonderful is hearing you talk about how this business has evolved. And sometimes when you're on to something big, in that moment, doesn't look that big, and as time plays out, you see how it all goes, because you guys were clearly in the right place at the right time. Well, and then we started associating with whatever uh, digital, um, uh, digital site came up. Uh, the shift came pretty quick to broadband, uh, and then you'd be able to download things. Um, so uh, we were off and running as the orchard, mm -hmm. and eventually we, um, we took an investment, and the company was sold to a um, a, a group of uh, investors that were great people that um, that put in, you know, proper uh, business acumen and um, and allowed it to grow and grow and grow. Where today we're probably the largest um, distributor of um, at least music and mm. um, perhaps media and uh, digitally in the world. Amazing how things can change. Uh, you mentioned something here. I want to just segue to a question from one of our members. This whole idea of why not is something I, I, I think is brilliant in its simplicity. You know, it's very easy to come up with a million reasons why something isn't going to happen in the music business. Uh, that's not a recipe for doing something great in the music business because I'll tell you right up front, Richard agree. you got a one in a million shot of having success sure. in this business. you got to be looking for the why not. I want to take a question here. Cut on, just go to the Ask Grand Man page. i got it right here on... Uh, um, network. Uh, a gentleman by the new name of Nayo Bear um, has a question. It says, it seems like the way to get into the industry nowadays is through knowing somebody or having the opportunity to be an intern. But for someone like me, that sadly isn't a reality. He said, what advice might you have for someone who's trying to get in the music but has no prior experience and isn't eligible for, for internships? Uh, 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 yeah, I'm going to say why not, number one, why, you know, why you're not eligible. But, you know, he seems to be having that college mentality. I can't be an intern. You can always decide you're going to go well, to work for somebody and help them out for free until you prove some value. Yeah, Thoughts? yeah. Well, internships, uh, now companies like ours, there has to be, uh, the law provides you have to pay interns. Mm -hmm. um, in the past, in you York. didn't have to. Yeah. Uh, uh, or college credit. Now, if, if uh, he's in college... I, I think in university, I think you can get credit mm -hmm. uh, toward a course for um, for uh, serving as an intern. But but internship, m many of the people that came to the orchard as interns remained and got jobs there afterwards mm -hmm. um, because they proved that they could make a contribution mm -hmm. to the benefit and the growth of the company. And uh, when an opportunity arises to hire somebody, we're going to look first to the people who are there. So uh, well, yeah. I would say any company, any experience, learning and just seeing close hand how things are done is very, very important. It's important. And I think you know, notwithstanding some of the legal things out there today that, that, that has happened at some of the bigger companies out there, you know, um, when you're interning, it's your chance to audition. It's your chance to prove that you have more than just enthusiasm. You have a, a dose of killer instinct, some ability to identify um, some problem that needs to be solved. And you saw that. I'm looking at our intern over there, a former intern now, employee Cody Romanis, who came in as an intern. The first thing he did was clean out our closet here, which I'd been bitching about for years in my shower over here, which would become a closet. Those little acts of that had nothing to do with his music business skills told me something about his attitude, that he was willing to dive into the places that nobody else did. And for me, 
I never asked him whether he had a degree. He actually has a degree in the music business from USC. The other thing that convinced me is a USC football player who volunteered for the kickoff team, Richard. My kind of guy. Trojan man. <laughs> there he is over there. He's all shy. And our guy sitting right next to him, that handsome man with the dreads, uh -huh. you know, James Early, uh, who today was a couple minutes late there, Rich, or James, you know, but I'm not paying him, so that's okay. Uh, he came out here from Houston, Texas, uh, and it hasn't gone back home yet. Well, uh, and he's going to have a job. He just was interviewing the other day with a friend of mine. You know, I don't know if you're going to be David Letterman, but YouTube is the new TV. Yeah. You know, come on. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm betting that, you know, we can do the TV part, the, the, the David Letterman paycheck part. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we could, you know, we could use some I work see, on that. I didn't see any advertising. Did see advertising? No, no, not advertising. Yeah, we're going to get to, uh, yeah. This it's whole a, thing for me started for as fun, Richard. It's and, okay. I mean, I and, but it's turning into something more great. than that. And, and so I'm trying to spend some more time on the uh, biz yeah. dev yeah. side of things. Okay. No, it's great. Okay. Um, all right. So we answered some questions. Uh, before we, I let you leave, you know, you should be tired by now, Richard. You should be off, you know, on a boat sailing around the world. But you keep showing up, keep starting stuff. Um, I noticed that you had um, started a label. I, we've, we've talked about you have a penchant for working with the ladies, right? So I want you to talk about what it is you're working on today uh, well, before we let you leave. Because your career is not over. It's still in progress. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I still work day to day on uh, uh, on projects and things at the orchard. I'm uh, my, my title is founder and uh, uh, creative chief officer. creative officer, um, and um, we've expanded to the point where we're now on two full floors, and um, we actually just built a wonderful recording studio. So I mean. We built a recording studio, so I now have a, uh, an outlet to create again and um, started, um, reactivated a production company that's, that was called Instant Records, but it, it was really a production company, uh, reactivated it as a label and have uh, uh, a number of uh, artists signed uh, that, I'm de that I'm developing there. Um, the interesting thing is I decided for a while to keep the whole label all women. So it's an all-female label. The first signing was a group called Au Revoir Simone. Um, they were around for a while and have done pretty well. Um, uh, um, the one now that I think is really exceptional is um, a girl named Jessica Hernandez. Her name is Jessica Hernandez and the Deltas. That's the name of the band. And they are... They're going to be, um, they tour consistently. She's from Detroit, and they'll be uh, traveling and opening up for this group, uh, St. Paul and Broken Bones, uh, in October, uh, a group that's really sort of exploding uh, now uh, in, in the U.S., and um, uh, several other artists uh, on the label. Um, I have one uh, that I'm working with called Princess Superstar. She... Uh, while her record didn't do that well, in, in the course of shooting a video with her, uh, I discovered that we can edit it down and piece it together and maybe approach it from a different angle, and we created a YouTube reality show. So if anybody out there wants to go and have a look at uh, I Love Princess Superstar, it's on her site, princesssuperstar.com, and um, you, I, I think you'll enjoy it. So, so you find music leading you into another thing. And Scott and I also manage uh, mm -hmm. the Dum Dum Girls uh, and the Ravenettes, who are at the El Ray tonight. Uh, and um, and a, um, a girl named uh, Queen Kwong, uh, whose real name is Kare, but um, she's an interesting artist because she's not only a... Uh, um, a hard, uh, heavy recording artist, but she has a um, ability to make videos. And uh, she's done a whole album <laughs> now of um, the album plus five minute videos of each song. So what you see um, is a collection of people that are, um, that are doing things uh, in addition to making mm -hmm. music, yeah, and uh, that I think that's.
that's the day because music, um, music can't be the beginning of every uh, and end of everything anymore. We're mm. living in a mass media world, and if you're going to be an artist, you need to be able to fulfill the other elements. Yeah, you need to paint the full picture, today. And it's, it's been my great takeaway as well. And 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 in some ways. Is how this little web show started. Somebody, ah, oh, you know, you should do a book, or you should, you know. And I just sat there and thought, Christ, you know, I've been a manager for a long time. I have, I don't have the patience to hardly get through an email to actually write a book. In old school uh, wouldn't happen. So I decided to do videos and, and a little web show because it's a little bit easier to get the message out there. Um, all right, one final question for you. You know, so many of the folks, most of the folks that are coming to our website. Uh, are dreaming about doing something big in the music business. Um, if you were going to leave somebody with one piece of advice today that's looking to do something big in their life, not just the music business, what would it be? Okay, I would say you got to believe in yourself. You know, I mean, that would be it. Um, um, there, there are a lot more important things that people can do than enter the music business. Uh, I actually was a history major, went to law school, and then got sucked into this, and to my mother's chagrin until the day she died, uh, never forgave me, probably, and would always ask, so what is it you do? And, and she would. Uh, but the point is, if you go out and you believe in yourself um, and realize that uh, life isn't just about success and failure, because there are many ways to succeed, and uh, I think you, you, you succeed within. And if once you understand that, you have a chance of succeeding without. One of my mentors said it to me best. He goes, Randy, you got to love the ride. Didn't talk about the money. He said, you got to love the ride. Oh, and yeah. That, it's and not about the money. Uh, and, of course, there are people that, that do things for money. And as you should, the world charges you to yeah. live in it. Yeah. I mean, we're not... Uh, <laughs> we're not uh, you know, we're, we're, we need, yes, I definitely think you should be paid for what you do, but you should believe in what you do first, and, and what you get from it will come back yeah, to you. Yeah, I think the, the money can follow. Great advice there. All right, folks, that's it for today's uh, session. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us. I want to thank Cody and James back there for doing a great job. My son, Matt Rennie, for helping out all those clicks you hear in the background is him snapping away. We'll post some of those questions later. Uh, if you haven't checked out our website, go back to the web for one second. Check out our website. It's called renmanmusicandbusiness.com. Obviously, you got here today. I encourage you to sniff around, check out the feed. There's all kinds of great information from some of the smartest, most talented, most successful people in the music business, all of whom have had a hell of a ride and seem to enjoy the heck out of it. My name's Steve Rennie. Red, website, web, 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 you web it. The website's redmanmusicandbusiness.com. The show is Red Man Live. We'll see you again soon. See ya.